Hey everybody, welcome back to NeuroPsyQ. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We hope to see you joining us weekly as we post neuroscience videos every Saturday at 8 a.m. As Canada and other countries around the world begin to lift some of the rules and regulations put into place because of COVID-19, we are going to do a little recap of the neurological impacts of COVID and we are also going to touch on some things that have been seen over the past months with COVID-19. I'm pretty sure practically Every country in the world is talking about COVID and almost every channel of the news that you switch to will mention COVID at some point. So most of us know that COVID-19 is a virus similar to SARS that attacks the respiratory system by binding to ACE2 receptors on the surface of the lungs. And so a lot of the symptoms of COVID-19 involve shortness of breath, coughing, and things that would seem to be typical respiratory ailments. Now, something that not a lot of people are talking about is the fact that 50% of COVID-19 patients actually suffer from neurological symptoms as well. Now, this can be a wide range of things, anything from headaches to strokes to issues with smell and taste that were more popular in the media, things like acute necrotizing encephalopathy, encephalitis, and other neurological ailments. The nervous system includes the brain, the spinal cord, nerves, and so by affecting the nervous system there's pretty widespread symptoms that would appear throughout the body. And one of the common reasons that we have touched upon in previous videos for why COVID-19 affects the nervous system is the fact that there is an immune response to the virus and this immune response can actually cause inflammation and damage to the nervous system. Now, in a recent paper, two doctors actually called COVID-19 a global threat to the nervous system. And what they did was review all the neurological incidences that were associated with COVID-19. Now, the nervous system, we're not just talking about the central nervous system. It doesn't have to be a direct effect on the brain. We can have effects to the periphery as well. And so with the hyperinflammatory response that is seen in COVID-19, and also another response, which is hypercoagulation, which is when we have increased clotting in the blood, those two responses can actually impact brain function. So with that being said, we've seen things like encephalopathy, encephalitis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, meningitis, stroke, venous sinus thrombosis, and endotheolitis. There have already been around 6 million cases of COVID worldwide, and with these cases, we've had neurological manifestations, whereas with SARS and the MERS virus, there was a low amount of neurological manifestations. It was quite rare to see encephalopathy and stroke, and there was rarely direct infection of the brain and a low amount of post-infectious immune-mediated complications. So that would be things that happen after you get the virus and your immune system is responding, which can impact your nervous system. Now with COVID, we have seen neural complications. Around 17% of patients present with dizziness, 13% present with headaches, uh, we have impaired consciousness in around 7.5%. Acute cerebrovascular disease is more rare, but we have seen it in 3%. Ataxia is the rarest, around 0.5% people present with ataxia, which is uh, inability to move, and seizures have also been seen in a low subset of the population, around 0.5% of people. When we separate COVID based on its severity though, those that are suffering severely from the virus tend to have more neurological manifestations, and so these patients tend to be older. They average at around 58 years old versus an average of 49 for the patients with less severe symptoms. And what we see with them is they have higher D-dimer in their blood. And this is something that indicates clotting in the blood. After clots start to break down, D-dimer is released. And so if you have higher D-dimer, it showed that there was a greater immune response. 
These patients are also more likely to have renal and hepatic failure. So the severity of their diagnosis actually influences their chances of suffering from something neurological as well. Encephalopathy is one of the ways that COVID-19 can affect the nervous system. This is something with an unknown mechanism and we have talked about acute necrotizing encephalopathy in a previous video so if you want to learn more about that you can watch that video but basically this is a symptom that is associated with people that have a severe disease, other comorbidities, multi-organ system dysfunction, hypoxemia, so low blood oxygen levels. The virus, however, is not detected in their cerebral spinal fluid and there is no pleocytosis, which is increased white blood cell count in the nervous system. So what we get from that is that this encephalopathy is kind of a side effect of COVID-19, but we haven't seen that the COVID-19 is entering the nervous system directly because there was no detection of it in the CSF and there was also no change in the white blood cell count, which would indicate an immune response. Another thing that can happen with COVID-19 is acute cerebrovascular disease. Now, this is pretty rare. It only occurs in about 3% of patients. Acute cerebrovascular diseases are things like ischemic stroke, venous sinus thrombosis, micro and macro bleeds. So these, again, are indirect effects on the nervous system. Indirect because the COVID-19 isn't actually entering the brain, but with hypercoagulation We can have blood clots and that can cause stroke We can also have micro and macro bleeds which is where vessels in the brain are damaged and blood actually gets into the brain Which is not a typical thing now we look at whether or not neural invasion can happen and so this would be something like encephalitis with encephalitis we do see csf pleocytosis so there is a rise in white blood cells in the central nervous system there's also elevated inflammatory proteins in the cns as well now what is encephalitis encephalitis is inflammation of the brain it varies in severity. Uh, this would include symptoms of fever, headache, confusion, stiff necks, and sometimes vomiting. So with patients that had COVID-19 and presented with encephalitis, they did see invasion of the nervous system. Some cases didn't have direct invasion though, but the patients did present with nucal rigidity which is stiffness of the neck, so they're not able to flex their neck forward. They also have altered mental status and they have mild cerebral spinal fluid lymphocytic pleocytosis, which is excess white blood cell count in the cerebral spinal fluid. Also with this encephalitis, we see tissue damage and it has been seen in SARS before, but this is also something that we are now seeing with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, what about some post-infectious and immune-mediated complications? Now, these are some things that can happen with the influenza virus as well, and this is basically because of the virus, your immune system's responding, and the responses of your immune system actually impact the nervous system in a detrimental manner. Something we have seen in COVID-19 patients is something called Julien Barré syndrome. And this is a rare disorder where your body's immune system is attacking your nerves. And so we have weakness and tingling in your extremities. Those are the first symptoms, so like pins and needles and inability to move the fingers and toes. These sensations can quickly spread throughout the body and eventually it may end up causing paralysis of the whole body. So there were five cases of Julien Barré syndrome in Italy in 1000 to 1200 of the cases that were seen in the hospital. This is higher than the amount of Julien Barré syndrome we see in the normal population. There is also a variant of Julien Barré syndrome, which is called Miller-Fisher syndrome. It is a rare acquired nerve disease. 
and it's characterized by abnormal muscle coordination, paralysis of the eye muscles. So often they look at the, ab the ability of a person to abduct their eyes or to look up and down, stuff like that. And they also have the absence of tendon reflexes. So, you know, when you go to the doctor and they hit your knee, that would be absent. These symptoms are often seen after viral illness. And so the fact that we're seeing it with COVID-19 isn't unexpected. It's not exactly a shocking discovery. It's still an impact on the nervous system worth discussing. In one paper that looked at Guillain-Barré syndrome in COVID-19 sufferers, what they saw was five to 10 days after COVID-19 onset, there were symptoms of this ailment. And so there were only five cases that were looked at in the paper, but three of the cases had respiratory failure, two of them showed facial weakness, two of them had caudal nerve enhancement. Um, they all had normocellular cerebrospinal fluid, so there was an immune response. Three of the patients had elevated protein, which is also known as albuminocytological dissociation. So this is when there's elevated protein in the cerebrospinal fluid, but no change in white cell count, which is an odd thing to see. There was no COVID-19 in the cerebral spinal fluid and three had anti-gangliocide antibodies. These antibodies are associated with Guillain-Barré syndrome. We know that antibodies attack foreign invaders. Now, if we have an antibody that is attacking your gangliocells, or anti-gangliocide antibodies, your body is attacking the immune system. So this is an autoimmune disorder. Again, other things we've seen in patients are things like acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, acute necrotizing encephalopathy. Again, we talked about that one in another lecture, but basically with this you see bilateral thalamic lesions. The mechanism is unknown, but it is also associated with influenza and we think that it is caused by inflammation. There's also a genetic factor. Another one is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which is seen with symptoms of dysarthria, dysphagia, which is when you don't want to eat food, facial weakness, and gaze preference. This arthria is when you have impairment of the muscles that are need to produce speech, and so there's inability to communicate through speech. Now the more common nervous system impact that we've seen with COVID-19 is our loss of smell and loss of taste. This is more frequent. We're not sure how common it is though. Some studies have shown as little as 6% of patients suffering with it, and others suggest all the way up to 96% of patients having a presentation of loss of smell or loss of taste. Some people propose that maybe this is because we have direct infection of the olfactory bulb, but the more commonly accepted and more feasible suggestion is that perhaps the olfactory sensory nerves right in your nose are getting infected and so we're losing the receptor nerves not actually impacting the brain the problem with covid 19 is that it's hard to estimate how much of an impact we are having or how often we're seeing these symptoms because we also know that around 80 percent of people are asymptotic it's hard to know how many patients on average are presenting with something like loss of taste if some patients don't even have symptoms at all and they're not even getting tested so they're not part of the numbers that we look at. For instance, when we were saying in Italy that we had a five cases of Julien Barré syndrome out of 1,000 to 1,200 cases that they looked at, well, there could have been way more cases but they were just missed because of lack of testing. Now the last thing I want to talk about is a letter to the editor that was recently written that mentioned that COVID-19 does have these symptoms like headache, altered mental status, and anosmia. What this letter looked at was autopsies of people that died of COVID-19 and so the average age of these individuals was around 62 years old. 78% of them were men, that's 14 of them. So based on that they probably had a group of 18 individuals. They saw 
myalgia, which is muscle weakness, headaches, decreased taste in these patients as well. And so they had these neurological symptoms, but they did also have a lot of comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, hyperlipidemia, chronic kidney disease, and some of them had had prior strokes. A few had dementia, and there was also anaplastic astrocytoma that was seen in one of the patients. When they did the autopsy, they did H&E staining of 10 standard regions in the brain. They saw arteriosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries, but despite this, there was no stroke, herniation, or olfactory bulb damage. They kept on mentioning that they didn't see olfactory bulb damage. I think the importance of that and them highlighting that was they were just trying to use that as evidence to the fact that perhaps the loss of smell and the loss of taste isn't happening because of damage to the olfactory bulb, but it could be because of damage to the olfactory receptor neurons. They kept on highlighting it, but one thing that they didn't do was mention how many of the patients presented with anosmia. They all presented with acute hypoxic injury. So hypoxia is when we have a lack of oxygen, a lower level of oxygen than normal. And so if you have hypoxia, we know that all our cells in our body need oxygen. If they're not getting enough oxygen, what happens is we start to have necrosis or cell death. So what they saw in the brains of these individuals was that there was hypoxic injury or locations where cell death had occurred because of lack of oxygen. Now again, if we think about COVID-19's impact on the lungs, the fact that it's uh, infecting our tissue in our lungs and it could be reducing the amount of surface area in the lungs, we're probably not getting enough oxygen if we're suffering from COVID. So we saw injury in the cerebrum and the cerebellum. There was neuronal loss in the cerebral cortex, the hippocampus, Purkinje cell layer, but nothing in the olfactory bulbs or tracts. There was also no thrombi or vasculitis. Now thrombi are the blood clots, so none of these patients presented with blood clots, which could have been causing the hypoxic injury and vasculitis is inflammation of blood vessels which again would change uh, the blood vessel walls and they could restrict blood flow and cause the hypoxic injury that we are observing but none of them presented with it so there's probably some other reason that these individuals all presented with acute hypoxic injury other than thrombi and vasculitis when they did staining for SARS-CoV-2, there was no staining in the neurons, no staining in glial cells, no staining in the, none in the endothelium, and none in immune walls. So, these symptoms or this damage to the brain that was observed was not because COVID had actually got into the brain, but because of what COVID was doing to the rest of the body. And if you think of that, our whole body is kind of like a connected ecosystem. All the symptoms need to function together, and if something's out of whack, then another symptom's going to get affected. But it doesn't mean that that system is what is directly threatened with the virus. So the biggest change that we saw was hypoxic injury to the central nervous system. And as you can see, if our lungs are getting attacked, then this can definitely have an impact on our brain and the rest of the nervous system. That's all for today's video. If you have any questions on the content, feel free to ask. Leave that down in the comments below. There are three links below for the three papers that we looked at to give us this information. So I hope you enjoyed the summary that I put together. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up, make sure you subscribe, and we hope to see you next week for another video. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next week.